observe the Tisarana Panchasila, please say Namaskara. Namo Tase Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhase Namo Tase Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhase Buddhang Saranang Gachami Buddhang Saranang Gachami Dhammang Saranang Gachami Dhammang Sanghang Saranang Gachami Sanghang Saranang Gachami Dutiyam Pi Buddhang Saranang Gachami Dutiyam Pi Buddhang Saranang Gachami Dutiyam Pi Dhammang Saranang Gachami Dutiyam Pi Dhammang Saranang Gachami Dutiyam Pi Sanghang Saranang Gachami Gachami Tiyam pi sanggang saranang gachami Tatiyam pi buddhang saranang gachami Tatiyam pi buddhang saranang gachami Tatiyam pi dhammang saranang gachami Tatiyam pi dhammang saranang gachami Tatiyam pi sanggang saranang gachami Tatiyam pi sanggang Tisaranagamanang sampunang Panatipatavirmani sikhapadang samadhyami Adinnadanavirmani sikhapadang samadhyami Kame sumichachara virmani sikha padang samadhyami Musavada virmani sikha padang samadhyami Suramiraya manjupamadathana virmani sikha padang samadhyami Tisaranena saddhing panchasilang dhammang sadhukang surakhitang katva appamadena sampadeta Samanta chakhavadesu atra gachantu devata Saddhammang munidajas sunantu sagamakadang Dhammasavana kalo ayang badanta Dhammasavana kalo ayang badanta Dhammasavana kalo ayang badanta Namo tas bhagavato arato samma sambuddhas Namo tas bhagavato arato samma sambuddhas Namo tas bhagavato arato samma sambuddhas Sambha papas akaranang kusalas upasampada Satchitta pariyoda panang etang buddhanu sasanang ti Dear friends in the Dhamma, today we will think about the Buddha's teachings and especially Mrs. Guptani Gunasekara who organized this Dharma Desana, um, who just lost her mother a little while ago. She wants to have this Dharma Desana in order to transfer merits to her late father, Danister I. Fernando, who passed away on the 1st of April in, 19, in uh, 2006. And um, her late husband, Johann Gunasekra, who passed away on the 16th of March, 1993. And then now also, today only, uh, we got to know that her mother passed away. Mrs. 
Was it uh, Fernando passed away on the 13th of March 2008? So when we are listening to the Dhamma, we can remember Buddha's teachings and with great faith in our mind, Sadha, and also with some effort, virya, to create kusala chetana, skillful thoughts in our minds, and with karuna and metta, that is, with compassion and with loving kindness in our minds, we can listen to the Dhamma and think of what the Buddha meant to say. When the Buddha summed up his teachings in very short two lines, he said, I'm only teaching two things, basically. That is, dukkha and the way out of dukkha. That is the shortest form of Buddha's teachings. And in the stanza that I recited at the beginning, sabba papasa akaranang kusalasa upasampada, satchitta pariyoda panang etang buddhanusasanang, there we find sabba papasa akaranang, not to do the akusala or the unskillful, to get away from the negativities, that is, from greed, hatred, anger, jealousy, and so on. And to promote the kusala, to develop skillful thoughts, words, and deeds by practicing loving kindness, compassion, generosity, and develop wisdom in our thoughts, words, and deeds. And then also to purify our minds and to develop the mind to get insight and wisdom. That will actually help us to overcome dukkha. So, Buddha's teachings are there, not just 2,550 and odd years ago, but the Buddha's teachings are still with us. And it was the late Mr. Danister I. Fernando who also practiced these uh, Buddha's teachings in his own daily life. Not only that, he also taught even at this very temple, Sambodhi Vihara. He was one of the founders of the English Dhamma class at Sambodhi Vihara. He also wrote numerous articles on the Dhamma, a series of uh, articles on the significance of the Poyade, the full moon, let the full moon shine, and various other kind of publications. He also associated with very learned and practicing monks, and also with the late Henry van Zeist, formerly known as Bhikkhu Olande Dhammapala, and so on. So it is especially on the day that we want to commemorate the late Mr. Danister Fernando uh, that we are having this Dhamma Desana on the Buddhist channel. And to also transfer merits to the other people who have passed away, especially Guptani's uh, late husband and just now her dear mother. And also, actually, for blessings for yourself. Bana is not just for the transference of merits to the people who have passed away, but also for blessing in your own life. Because when you are listening to the Dhamma, you're thinking about the Dhamma, you're investigating the Dhamma, and you're meditating on this within your mind, then lots of good things come to you. Mainly the kusala chetanas, the skillful thoughts based on aloba, advesha, amoha, the absence of greed, the absence of hatred, the absence of ignorance, and the presence of good thoughts, namely generosity, loving kindness, compassion, and wisdom. So in that way, we can gain not only merits for ourselves, but also wisdom and insight. Now, when it comes to um, wisdom, the Buddha said there are three kinds of uh, ways of gaining wisdom. One is through hearing. 
Sutta Maya Prajna, the wisdom which comes from listening to the Dhamma. That is, like the words of the Buddha that we listen to in the Bana, the Dhamma Desana, and then we um, sort of say, yes, that's right. We say sadhu when it is good, and um, we listen to it sometimes with one ear, but it may go out the other. It doesn't sort of stay in our mind all the time. Uh, we forget a lot of what is being said in the Dhamma. And uh, that is the weakness, we can say, of the Sutta Maya Prajna, because it is not your own wisdom. It is somebody else's wisdom which comes through your ears. And if you read a Bana book, it may be coming through your eyes, but it is like borrowed wisdom, second-hand wisdom. It's not yet your own. For that, we need to think about the Dhamma and to investigate the Dhamma and to discuss the Dhamma. Kalena Dhamma Sakaccha Etang Mangala Mutta Mangila. To discuss the Dhamma from time to time is a great blessing. And even Dhamma Viche, or the, the, the uh, investigation of the Dhamma within your mind, is also one of the factors towards enlightenment. So to investigate the Dhamma, to think about it, and to discuss it with other people also, and to uh, repeatedly remind yourself, and to um, question yourself also whether you have understood this, then that becomes what is called Chintamaya Prajna, the wisdom which comes from your mind. That is also some kind of wisdom which you are internalizing that becomes more or less your own, but it is still not enough to change your mind completely. It is still in the form of thoughts and concepts. It's like at the intellectual level. For that further development of uh, wisdom, we actually need what is called bhavana maya prajna, the wisdom which arises from bhavana, the development of your mind, or meditation. So meditation is one way of um, getting insight wisdom, the wisdom which arises through the practice of some sort of development of your mind. Now with meditation, we have different kinds of approaches. We have what is called samatha bhavana, the tranquility meditation, which can be practiced in different, different ways, different, different forms. If we look at uh, the Visuddhimagga, the path of purification written by Buddha Gosahamdru, for instance, we see that there are 39 kamatanas which have to do with samatha bhavana. Tranquility meditation can be practiced in different ways. For instance, we can reflect on the qualities of the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. Buddha Nusati Bhavana, Dhamma Nusati Bhavana, Sangha Nusati Bhavana. Those are three types of reflections which are leading to Sraddha and also some kind of calmness in your mind, some kind of Samatha. Then we can uh, practice Metta Bhavana, the development of universal loving-kindness to all beings and also to oneself. In order to give loving-kindness to others, we have to be able to give it to ourselves. So usually we start wishing ourselves to be free from anger and fear. May I be free from anger and fear. May I be free from greed, hatred and delusion. May I be free from conflict and suffering, dukkha, may I be well, peaceful, and happy. And then for other beings, may all beings, near and far, be free from conflict and suffering, free from dukkha. May all beings, human, animal, the visible and invisible, be well, peaceful, and happy. May all beings in all directions, near and far, be well, 
peaceful and happy. Sabbe satta bhavantu sukitatta. In the Karaniya Metta Sutta, wishing all beings to be well, peaceful and happy. Now when you have this Maitri or Metta inside your mind and you fill your mind with it, then you purify your mind and it becomes like a protection for yourself as well as others. That is why Metta Bhavana is also called one of the Araka Bhavanas. Buddha Dhamma Sangha Nusati is also one of the Araka Bhavanas that protect your mind from, uh, let's say, negative thoughts and emotions. And Metta also will help you to protect you from negative thoughts and emotions, but also it has a lot of other advantages, what is called Anisangsas. Metta Anisangsa Sutta is one sutra in which the Buddha has stated 11 kinds of good results or Anisangsas of the practice of Metta. For instance, if you practice Metta Bhavana just before you go to sleep, you find that you fall asleep very well, that you have no bad dreams, that you wake up refreshed, that people become more friendly to you, even that animals become friendly, and even that enemies turn around and become friendly, and also that your complexion becomes better, and that your mind and even your blood gets purified, and in that way you have a longer and healthier life. So with the practice of metta, we have a lot of benefits and a lot of what is called anisangsas. So that is also a kind of araka bhavana or protective meditation. Then we can reflect on, for instance, the uh, loathsomeness of the body, what is called the uh, asubha bhavana, to just think about the actual nature of the hair on the head, the hair on the body, then the skin, the teeth, the nails, and uh, different parts of the body. If you go from the outside to the inside, you find out that the body is not as beautiful and as attractive as sometimes we think. Then we get to see what is called the bilikul nature, the asubha, or the uh, unattractive nature of the body. That helps us to overcome wrong identification and too much attraction to our own body and that of others. And therefore it is also one of the Araka Bhavanas, the one of the protective meditations. Then we have the Maranusati Bhavana to uh, reflect on death. And uh, not in a morbid way that death is something that is uh, bad or that is ugly, but that death actually takes place and we actually have uh, realized that just even today, just before this Dhamma Desana, that the mother of Guptani Gunasekara passed away. And she, in her wisdom, managed to reflect wisely on this loss and on this nature of life and death and um, has completely accepted it and realized that by having this Dhamma Desana also we can transfer merits to her late mother. And uh, by reflecting on death itself we realize that life and death is something that is taking place all the time, birth and death. From moment to moment actually we are as if we are being born and dying from moment to moment. Every moment is actually a moment of birth and the next moment of death. And um, we never know at what time and in what way we will actually pass our last breath. And also we should be able to prepare ourselves for that moment by developing our minds reflecting wisely and to be able to let go of everything, of our attachments, of our greed, of our cravings, of our wrong identification, and to be able to really let go 
of everyone, including one's own body. And in that way, reflecting on death, marana nusati bhavana, is a meditation which can also protect ourselves and prepare ourselves for that final moment when it is very important to be free from anger and fear, from greed and hatred, and from delusion. Because basically, what the Buddha taught is that it is tanha and avidya which are the main causes for our own suffering. In the Four Noble Truths, the Chaturarya Satya, we find as the first one, of course, the fact of dukkha or unsatisfactoriness of all what is called samsaric existence. From birth to death, we don't always get what we want. We grow older, we get sick, we lose people, situations change, we get what we don't want or we don't get what we want. We are being separated from those whom we love. Sometimes we are confronted with ugly people in ugly situations. And that is all a form of unsatisfactoriness. And even the most pleasant and beautiful moments also are called dukkha in the sense that they don't last, they are not forever. They are not unconditioned kind of happiness. And therefore, it is also a form of unsatisfactoriness or dukkha. So therefore, the reflection on dukkha itself can help us also to overcome what is called wrong identification with our panchaskanda, our five aggregates, the body, the feelings, our perceptions, our intentions, and the content of our consciousness. Usually we think of ourselves as me, mine, myself, my own, and we tend to think that that is a static thing, or that it is there forever. But reflecting upon it, and um, not only reflecting, but also looking at it with mindfulness, with awareness, we can see how quickly everything is changing. Within our mind especially, we can see the changes. Now, when we say mind, we mean feelings and perceptions, intentions and consciousness. So it is seeing and hearing, smelling, tasting, touch sensations, and thinking. How quickly it changes, you can realize by just looking at yourself from the inside, so to speak, through introspection, meditation, and pay attention to that changing nature. Then you see, ah, yes, everything is in a flux. Everything is changing. What we thought that is permanent also turns out to be impermanent. So, sabbe sankara anicca, that is the truth of the matter. Even though we may like the things to stay longer or last longer than they actually do. So, to overcome dukkha, we have to accept the change. If we don't accept the change, if we fight the change, if we think it should be different, if we can't realize the changing nature, then we do have a problem then we create our own causes of our suffering. Because there is a conflict between what is and what we want, what we think that is. So if we can adjust our mind to the reality of the things as they really are, and to see the things as they really are, yatha, bhuta, jnana, dasana, as the Buddha calls it, then we can have no conflict between our own perception and the reality as it is, that is, between our concepts and the reality. So, we have to uh, adjust not only our concepts, but our, our whole perception to see the things as they really are. And for that, we do need not just tranquility meditation or samatha bhavana, but we need what is called insight meditation, the practice of mindfulness, leading to insight, and insight to wisdom, and that again to liberation from suffering. So, mindfulness is the way for the purification of our minds and for the overcoming of suffering, 
and even for the realization of the highest good, which is Nibbana. That is what the Buddha said in the beginning of the Satipatthana Sutta, where he says, just uh, go and sit in, at the foot of a tree, or go to an empty place, or go to a hermitage, and not only that, whether you are standing or sitting, lying down, or uh, walking, or whatever you are doing, pay attention to your body, to your feelings, to your mind, and to the characteristics of it. See the changing nature of it. See how unsatisfactory it is because it is changing, and realize the non-self nature. If we realize that, not just in words or in concepts, but through what we call insight wisdom, that is called vipassana jnana, then we actually purify our minds. Then we find that the attraction and the attention, the uh, attachment and also the craving for the sense objects will diminish because we realize these things are all changing. So to overcome suffering, we really have to have a change in our mind and that change can come sometimes by suttamaya prajna, by listening to the Dhamma, sometimes through the cintamaya prajna, thinking about the Dhamma, investigating it, but especially through what is called the bhavana maya prajna, the wisdom which arises from meditation. And not just any kind of meditation, not the tranquility meditation, because that tends to give us only what is called temporary peace of mind, which is also very good to have, but not the end and all of our development of our minds. The Bodhisattva, you know, Siddhartha, when he was seated under the tree before his enlightenment, realized that the stages of his meditation, which he had learned from his teachers, were actually conditioned states. That means the Ashtasamapati, the eighth absorptions, the eighth state of dhyana, even that lofty state was still a conditioned state of mind, not a really liberated state of mind. And he also realized as long as there is this conditioned state of mind, we are not really free from samsaric existence. We will be reborn somewhere, either in a Brahma Loka or in a Deva Loka, or in some other realm, any of the 31 levels of existence, according to that state of mind at the time of death, plus our what is called habitual karma, all the deeds and the karmic activities from this lifetime and the previous lifetimes, all accumulated, leading to that next life, whether it is in the human world or in any of the more happy realms or in the unhappy realms, depending on the kusala and the akusala or the pin and the pao which we have done in the past, plus that state of mind which we are in when we pass away. So to develop the mind is a very necessity for, of our life. The Buddha says the mind is actually the forerunner of all states. Mano pubangama dhamma, mano setta manomaya. You know, the mind is actually the kind of locomotive which pulls the train of our thoughts, words, and deeds. So if the mind is based on something unskillful, something bad, based on greed, hatred, and delusion, then the results also will be similarly akusala or uh, bad or unpleasant, full of suffering for oneself or for others. And if the mind that uh, creates the thought and the word and the deed is based on something skillful, that is generosity, loving kindness, compassion, and wisdom, then those thoughts, words, and deeds become what is called kusala, and leading to kusala vipaka, or skillful results, or happy results, such as peace of mind, long life, ayu uh, varna sepa bala, and also prajna. Prajna, that is not always the 
automatic result of kusala uh, kamma, of skillful deeds, but uh, wisdom has to be cultivated. We can say that through, for instance, practicing of generosity, like giving dana, we may be getting good results uh, in the sense of receiving things. And um, maybe through the practice of sila and dana, we can um, have good conditions as a human being in this world and in the next. So what we are doing in sila and in dana practice, we are actually reconditioning the conditions of our life and for the better. Like from, we can go from light to light. Or if, we're in, if we are in the darkness, we can get out of the darkness and go towards the light. But with only dana and sila, we cannot really attain Nibbāna, even though we may wish so, or somebody may wish us to reach Nibbāna. For Nibbāna, we need something else, and that is the wisdom, the insight, knowledge, and the direct insight wisdom, which helps to dissolve the causes of our suffering. And that is why we need this practice of mindfulness. That is what the Buddha also discovered, and he went beyond his own teachers in the sense that he said, there must be something beyond all this conditioned existence. There must be something which is completely independent, completely unconditioned, unborn, uncreated. And um, that he discovered with his great determination not to get up from his seat under the Bodhi tree on the full moon of Visakha or Vesak. And um, he realized the deathless and the uh, unconditioned Nibbāna. So that is something which he realized through the development of wisdom. And also he could see, he said, the maker of this house. He realized who is the carpenter or the maker of this house. And that means the ignorance and the trishna or tanha, the craving. Craving and ignorance together make the house go on and on. That means the body and mind go on and on in samsara. So as long as there is ignorance or avidya, there will be craving and aversion. And the overcoming of avidya can be realized and can be achieved through the, well, the development of insight, wisdom, jnana or prajna. Jnana udapadi, prajna udapadi, chakku udapadi, alok udapadi, all those words of uh, the light that arose, the wisdom that arose, the knowledge that arose, that means uh, within oneself that kind of happening of the uh, opening of the eye of wisdom uh, takes place when we really apply what is called Samma Sati, right mindfulness. So in the Satipatthana Sutta, the Buddha has said that wherever you are, whatever you do, from the moment that you are awake till the moment you fall asleep, you have all these different occasions to be aware and to be mindful, to realize what you are doing, what you are saying, what you are thinking. We don't have to, by heart, a lot of uh, suttas in order to do that. There is a story of a young monk who was preparing himself for the higher ordination, Upasampada. He could not remember all the 227 sikshapadas of the Vinaya, and he thought, well, I'm not good enough uh, to get the higher ordination because I can't remember these things. So he asked from his teacher what to do, and he wanted to go home and disrobe. Then the teacher said, let's go to the Buddha and get advice from him. So the Buddha said, can you remember three things? Well, I suppose I can. Can you be aware of what you are doing, of your body? He says, yes, I can do that. And can you be aware of what you are saying with your mouth? Yes, I can do that. And then, can you be aware of what you are thinking? Well, I can try. Just these three things, thoughts, words, and deeds, hita, kaya, vachana, those three doors in which we are, with which we are in contact with the world, those are the three ways of mindfulness. 
the awareness of what we are doing and saying and thinking. And this little monk actually practiced it and became an arahat. He uh, could not remember a lot of rules, but he remembered to practice this, and he actually overcame all his own suffering and attained Nibbana in that way. So that shows that it is not the learning of a lot of rules and regulations and texts that makes one to realize the truth of things and to uh, come out of ignorance and uh, suffering, but actually the practice of mindfulness. In the Satipatthana Sutta, he said this is the way of mindfulness, the way of overcoming conflict and suffering and of purifying our mind and for the realization of the highest happiness, bliss and peace and security, that is Nibbana. So therefore, the practice of Satipatthana is advisable for everyone, not just for monks and nuns, bhikkhu, bhikkhunis, and those hermits who live in the Aranyas and far away from the society, but for everyone who is living in this world and in whatever function and whatever capacity they may be living. Because wherever you go, whether you go to a forest hermitage, whether you go to the middle of the sea or mid-air, or you are in the middle of the city, or you are at work, or you are in the kitchen, or wherever you are, you have your own body, feelings, and your mind with you, and your awareness, or the lack of it. <laughs> if we don't have enough awareness, and if we don't practice awareness, then we miss this chance. So actually, it is the practice of awareness of what we are doing and saying and thinking that can help us to overcome our own suffering. And that also leads to the right view, samma ditti, and also the right thoughts, samma sankappa. Even the right words and the right deeds, the right uh, sort of occupation, the right effort, the right mindfulness and right concentration, the whole of the Arya Ashtangika Magga it can be fulfilled when we practice this right mindfulness. And therefore, we can say mindfulness is like the central factor in our practice. But of course, there is also what we call Sadda, Virya, and also Samadhi and Prajna. Together with Sati or mindfulness, we have Sadda, that is faith faith in what you are doing, faith in the goal, faith in the teachings, faith in the method, and faith in oneself, that can help us to actually practice. And not only practice the Dhamma, but also in any kind of activity. One would have to have some faith, otherwise we can't do anything. And that faith can turn into what is called confidence when we see the results of what we are doing. Then sadda becomes more established. And sadda, or faith, is not meant to be blind faith, just accepting anything and everything which is being told, which is being written, which is being accepted by the majority of people. The Buddha, in the speech to the Kalamas, in the Kalama Sutta said, don't just believe anything and everything that is being told, said, or written. Even if I tell it to you, you have to think about it and uh, realize whether this is acceptable or not, whether it is going against reason or it is reasonable, and if it leads to the good or not. And if you find it is reasonable and it leads to the good, then you can accept it. If not, you don't need to accept it. So that kind of faith is uh, together with skeptical doubt in a way and to give the benefit of the doubt to what is being said and written, that freedom of thought the Buddha gave to the people and uh, that's one of the great um, qualities of uh, practicing Buddhists that they are free to think, free to investigate and finally to accept what is actually true. So faith and wisdom have to go hand in hand. 
just like the two wings of a bird. A bird cannot just fly on one wing, can it? It would be lopsided. So faith and wisdom have to balance out each other. Those two factors, these five, Sadda, Virya, Sati, Samadhi and Prajna, they all have to be balanced actually. And they are all leading to insight and wisdom and liberation. But uh, if we have only what is called intellectual wisdom and no faith, then also we are dry and intellectual and maybe uh, crooked or cunning and not able to really realize the final goal. So, uh, in the prajna or the wisdom, we have already mentioned the different stages, the different ways through suttamaya prajna, chintamaya prajna and bhavanamaya prajna, those three types of wisdom. Well, the bhavanamaya prajna being the highest and the deepest and the factor which really makes our mind uh, change. And then, of course, the practice of virya, effort. Without effort, we can't really achieve, achieve anything. Buddha's teachings are what is called going against the stream. The stream is usually downwards. It's very easy to go downstream, but a bit difficult to go upstream. So it's easy to go with one's greed, with one's hatred, with one's jealousies, and so on. But to overcome them, one would have to make some effort. And in the Eightfold Noble Path, we find that right effort is that where you don't allow akusala chetanas to arise. If they have arisen, you try to get rid of them, temporarily even suppress them, and replace them with some kusala. And if some kusala or skillful thought has arisen, then you try to cultivate it even more. So with those efforts, and the right effort, for instance, to remain mindful, to be aware, and to remain uh, awake, that kind of effort is there in the Eightfold Noble Path. So, sometimes we make too much effort in the wrong direction and nothing good comes out of it. Then we have to be careful and balance it. Sometimes we become restless if we make a big effort and nothing comes out of it. And if we make the wrong effort, we may not reach the goal either. So we have to be balanced with tranquility also. On the one hand, effort. On the other hand, tranquility and concentration of mind. If we have only effort and no concentration, there may be restlessness and scattered mind and doubts and all kinds of things coming to our mind. So, the practice of effort goes together with the practice of concentration. And for that, we have already mentioned several ways of uh, concentrating and quietening our minds with that Buddha Dhamma Sangha Nusati Bhavana, the Metta Bhavana, and what we have not mentioned yet is the Anapana Sati Bhavana, the concentration on our breath, the feeling of the breath as we are breathing in and out naturally, and that subtle sensation which we have inside the nostrils, near the tip of the nose, as a focal point something that is there actually from what we call the moment you start breathing till the moment you breathe your last. That is actually our life and um, we are very seldom paying attention to it. We are breathing all the time and let's say we sleep eight hours in the day, then we still have 16 hours of wakeful life. In those 16 hours, how many people actually pay attention to their breath? Very little. Maybe we are too busy with uh, other things and uh, listening to the news and uh, playing games and uh, uh, working and maybe driving and other things. But very seldom we pay attention to our breathing. Buddha said, whenever you have a chance and even when you don't have anything else to do, just pay attention to your breath. That is a very good exercise in mindfulness because you can really only feel the breath in the very present moment, not in the past, not in the future. The breath which we just took is already gone. The next breath is not yet there. So to live in the present is facilitated through the practice of 
mindfulness of breathing. And this is an object, what we call a bhavana aramuna, or an object of our meditation, which doesn't cost anything. It doesn't weigh anything, and is always with you. It is not a kind of imagination. It is not some kind of mantra or a visualization. It is a natural object, which is actually there with you all the time. And when you fly somewhere in an aeroplane, you don't have to pay any extra uh, for because there's no overweight. And uh, when you pay attention to your breathing, then you bring your mind into the present moment and you start becoming aware of other things also. Not just breathing, but also of your thinking, of your hearing, of your feeling, and all the senses become sharpened. Then, of course, we do need what is called some kind of equanimity or upekha. When we pay attention to everything, and if we would just be like reacting to those things with our conditioned mind, which is not yet purified, which is not yet at the state of an arahat, then we would only have aversion and attraction to the unpleasant and the pleasant. And um, we would be not really seeing the things as they really are. So we need a combination of right mindfulness and equanimity, even-mindedness, samma sati and opekha. Those two factors, if we practice it as much as possible, then we can start to see the things as they really are. And not only in the deepest sense of the word, but also in the worldly sense of the word. For instance, the ashta loka dharma, the eight worldly conditions. If we don't have equanimity, then with every gain we get elated, with every loss we get depressed, or with every praise we get very happy, with every blame we get unhappy. So if there's no equanimity, no upekha, then we will be just thrown about by the ups and downs and the vicissitudes of life. And every human being goes through these eight worldly conditions. The Ashtaloka Dharma are four pairs of opposites, like gain and loss, happiness and unhappiness, and fame and blame. Well, everyone has some of it at some time. And if we would um, not pay attention and if we would not understand that this is part and parcel of samsara, then we would just be uh, thrown here and there by these eight worldly conditions. So the wisdom also, even the worldly wisdom, to see that this is part and parcel of samsara, this is the way it is, and there's nothing to get excited about, there's nothing to get depressed about, this is the actual reality then it is also not me, mine, or my own, if you really look at it, if you realize the anatta aspect of it, and also see that it is all anicca, changing all the time, is not permanent, is not really yourself or your own, then we can have what is called a kind of detached view, a more neutral way of looking at it, a more realistic and uh, balanced view. And in that way, we can accept those eight worldly conditions. We realize that there's happiness, and we realize there's unhappiness. But we don't get elated nor depressed by it. So then there is more what is called peace of mind and equanimity. So this is very important for our day-to-day -day life also. And um, even with that combination of mindfulness and uh, equanimity, in the practice of mindfulness, we can also go deeper in the realization of the Buddha's Dhamma. For instance, when we look at something in the uh, outer world, let's say you look at um, a table or a chair or a glass of water, or you look at a person, usually we give it a name or we uh, like or dislike it, or we say this is made of... Uh, earth, water, fire, and air, or this is made of plastic, or this is made of glass, and uh, this is hard, this is soft, or this is uh, so-and-so if it comes to a person. But um, 
when you look at things uh, more deeply, and in science they use these uh, electronic microscopes to look at matter and uh, at a very, very um, minute detail in a very sometimes subatomical level, you find that between all these particles of what we look at as substance, for instance, diamonds, they are supposed to be very, very hard. And uh, some people say diamonds are forever. But if you look at the diamond, you find out it's also not forever. It's not as hard as it looks. There's a lot of space between the atoms and the molecules. And if you really look deeper and deeper, you find that it's just energy, concentrated energy, and not really matter or substance. So the Buddha realized this without the electronic microscope more than two and a half millennia ago, namely the insubstantiality of matter and the anatta nature of what we call a self. So to have that kind of vision and to see the things from what is called the paramartha satya or the absolute truth level and not only identify with what is called the sammuti satya or the relative reality, that gives us a good, well, a balanced view and also a wider perspective and therefore more uh, realistic view of things and another kind of dimension that we can um, look at things in different ways. So for our daily life, of course, we need to look at what is called the Sammuti Satya, very often the relative reality. And we need to, you know, do a lot of things to uh, live our lives. We have to look after ourselves, clothing and food and housing, medicines, education, a good uh, social status and all those kind of things. But when it comes to the understanding or the realization and also the attitude towards the life itself, then the deeper understanding of the um, anicca, dukkha and anatta, the changing nature of everything, the unsatisfactory nature of all the conditioned things, and the non-self or insubstantial nature of everything also helps us, especially for the overcoming of dukkha. And the Buddha said, when he said, I teach only two things, namely the existence of dukkha and the way out of dukkha, and then, of course, um, the different kinds of things we can do to get out of dukkha. Then Buddha told us, sila, samadhi, prajna, and vimukti. That is the way uh, that we can practice. Put order into your life, into your words, in your thoughts, and in your deeds. That is sila. Then develop your mind through samatha and vipassana. That is like the foundation and the development of our mind is like the building of a house and with the prajna or the wisdom as a kind of leak-proof roof on top of the house so that um, whatever rain comes, just like the feathers of the swan, whatever, or the leaf of the lotus, so much rain can come onto it, but it just rolls down and the being is not affected by the transitory nature of these things at all. And therefore, we have to reflect wisely on our own lives also. And when we think of those who have passed away, and especially when we think of the late uh, Mr. Dennis de Fernando, who has been steeped in the Dhamma also, who studied it, who practiced it, and who also taught it and shared it in his... Uh, thoughts and in his words and uh, with writings of articles and books and teaching in the somebody Dhamma school even and here and there and everywhere in his uh, discussions with friends, Dhamma discussions at home and in public and um, also the um, people whom uh, Mrs. Uh, Guptani Gunasekar wants to remember her late uh, husband Johan Gunasekar who passed away in uh, 1993, in, on the 16th of March. And then her uh, dear mother, who passed away just now on the 13th of um, March, Mrs. Uh, Rosita Fernando, 
and also those who are present at this uh, Dhamma Desana and those who are listening to this Dhamma Desana at home for the sharing of the merits. When you take Tisarna Panchasila and listening to the Dhamma and practicing the meditation, um, you gain all these skillful thoughts and therefore there's an accumulation of what is called Kusala Chetana and a lot of Punya Chetana, a lot of merits and they, those merits we want to share with all the protective deities, those who are protecting us and the country and the religion and uh, your places also and therefore we will share the merits with the devas. Emanang api tisarana panchasile ganiming eva geme banabhavana kiriming api raskaragaptu silma punya shakti apata raksha kranda silma devyantat Loki Sasana Raksha Krandasil Medeviantat, Me Pin Anumodang Veva, Anumodang Veming, Me Deviangi Asir Vadi Araksha, Apanitra Menebeva, Ayura Rogyak Sampat Kilabeva, Silam Pratana, Ishtisid de Veva, Kinahan Gaming Yukteva, Api Akasa Tachabumata, Kinagata Vakila, Pin Anumodang Karanimo, Akasa Tachabumata, Devana Gama Indica, Punyam Tanganamod. Chirang hakang to locus asanang, akasata chibumata diva nagama indica, punyang tang anamodita, chirang hakang to desanang, akasata chibumata diva nagama indica, punyang tang anamodita, chirang hakang to mang paranti, eva gamer, at tavatach am he, sambadang punya sampada, sabi deva anumodan to samba sampati siddhya, at tavatach am he, sambadang punya sampada, sabi buddha anumodan to samba sampati siddhya, at tavatach am he, sambadang punya sampada, sabi satta anumodan to samba sampati siddhya. Ilengata Tamatamangi Naming Mia Parlogiao, Adarniya Tata, Dennis Fernando, Eva Game, Hidipo Swami Prusha, Johan Gunaseka Mahatma, Eva Game Parlogia, Adarni Amma Vasita Fernando, Metinia Pradane, Silmu Parlogia Nyati, Mitradin, Gurvarung, Demopiang, Sahodriang, Dudarvang Adi, Ape Naming Mia Parlogia, Silmu Nyati Varuntat, Me Pinanamodang Viva. Anumodang viming eatangi duking nidas, utum ama mahani winning sana seva kinang gaming yuktava, idang me nyati nang hutu sukita hutu nyata yo, idang me nyati nang hutu sukita hutu nyata yo, idang me nyati nang hutu sukita hutu nyata yo. On day appears Karagat to see him upon the Shakti head to Kotagana, Buddha Passa Buddha Maharata, and Mohan Seda, Nivi, Sanasi, Pamini Vadada, Utum Amama, and Nirvana, some Patia Shakshat, Karganimata, May Punya Shakti, head to Vasana Viva, Pisadu Kaya, Tira Pratana Karaganimo. A bivadena seed is Serni Chang Vadha Pacha, Ino Chattaro, Dhamma Vadanti, Ayuvano Sukhang Balang, Ayura Rogi Sampati, Sagga Sampati, Mevacha, Atoni Bana Sampati, Iminati, Samijatu.